Panther is building Web3 dark pools for institutions. And what we're aiming to do is solve the problem that any pseudonymous blockchain user has. Mm -hmm. That being that when they conduct enough transactions, they start to make their identity available one way or the other. So mm -hmm. either through their transaction history, um, in terms of the amounts that they're sending, who they're transacting with, and whether it's a purchase or a trade uh, uh, or payroll or a donation, all of these types of transactions are highly sensitive and in the world we live in today are not disclosed. In a blockchain environment, however, those transactions are uh, forever on this immutable database. And with 99.6% of the value held in Web3 being on pseudonymous blockchains, like Ethereum, like Solana, like Polygon, uh, the, the scale of that problem is huge. Mm -hmm. And that problem is especially painful for uh, regulated financial service providers and large players, who sometimes are and are not regulated. And the reason for that is their transactions and the things that they do are impactful on the market. They can be impactful on the price, on the liquidity, on the sentiment. And so ensuring that those type of transactions are confidentially executed is what Panther brings to the game. There's a huge regulatory challenge. And I confess that when we began building Panther, we had a vision which was more of an inversion of the pyramid in the sense in terms of our strategy. So Panther has been envisioned as a fully decentralized protocol. And our original plan for deployment was to enable retail users to access what we call a zone. So Panther is essentially, we call it a multi-asset shielded pool. And it's this sort of universal anonymity set where users can transact with one another, do peer-to-peer -peer transactions, swaps, or connect to third-party DeFi contracts. And that pool is partitioned into any number of zones. So the go-to-market, if you will, will, was to enable retail users to permissionlessly self-custody their assets with Panther Protocol and conduct their transactions. And concurrently, that activity would be whitelisted and in a walled garden such that institutions can come and create their own zones. So the, the strategy was to service retail and then enable institutions to utilize the protocol. And because each zone is its own instance with its own users, its own transaction data, and zones are not able to interact by default, there was no issue there. Then, however, we saw a great deal of regulatory and law enforcement, particularly against Tornado Cash. And with the emerging regulatory regimes around the world, it's become clear, to us at least, that DeFi protocols, and particularly the operators of those protocols, require licenses of one kind or the other. And so we've inverted the strategy and said, okay, well, our core focus is going to be on these institutional zone managers uh, and enabling them to bring their users into private on-chain finance. So the distinction here is that to the rest of the market, Everything that happens in Panther is in a Panther zone is completely private, statistically private. Um, however, to the zone manager, everything that happens within that zone is at their discretion. So they may have a license which enables them to do things like a zero knowledge compliance attestation or have third party compliance providers. If that's the way they want to configure their zone, that's fine. On the other hand, if they need to have full enforcement, they can do so as well. So Panther enables its full configurability and modular plug and play compliance. There's this thing of, so who in a, who decides who gets to run a zone? It's not, no, it's not. I mean, there may, look, I think that if you really look at the operation of fully decentralized infrastructure, even groups like the Danish Financial Services Authority, released guidance and said, look, there is such a thing as full decentralization. Here's what it looks like. 
and there's a whole set of uh, boxes you have to tick. So I think that there is a path that we're going to see very clearly emerge for what full decentralization looks like. If and when that path emerges, then Panther will operate as a fully decentralized uh, on-chain dark code infrastructure. And in that case, zone managers can spin up their own zones. And in that case, what one zone manager does is their responsibility. Um, the key point is that that zone manager's transactions and users are not commingled with anyone else's. And so there's no concept of tainting the entire network uh, liquidity pool. Mm. So, and, and that's really important. If sanctions need to be brought against uh, the protocol, it won't be against the protocol as a universal piece of infrastructure. It will be against the zone manager. And then the DAO itself has the ability to uh, essentially freeze that zone from functioning, stop users from accessing the services. I think that that's good. So it's, it's anything that affects is affected to a particular zone and not everyone else. That makes sense. So how would you look at the difference? Like if you look at a private private blockchain and uh, someone forks it and uses it, they can still use it. Um, and it serves them the similar purpose, but this allows them to do it on a public network. Yeah. So one, it allows you to do it on a public network. And two, it allows you to access pre-existing liquidity. So ah, right. that's the key point where you find an L2 or another L1 saying, okay, well, we've built this ZK star, ZK star, whatever it is, fully homomorphic encryption environment. All you have to do is bring all your users and all your liquidity and start over and everything will be private. What Panther says is, as it, what Panther says is, the liquidity and the users are where they are, the network effects are where they are. We need to make accessing Uniswap private. We need to make accessing Aave private. We need to make transactions on Arbitrum or Ethereum private. Um, and so... Uh, so are you limited by any network right now? What are the networks you are in? Where anything is EVM compatible, Panther can be deployed on. Can be, but at this point? We're in the eighth of our nine stages of testnet mm -hmm. and we're deploying on Polygon as the first okay. live instance of the protocol. And our, our philosophy really is we will deploy the infrastructure where there is demand. We can deploy anywhere. N number of chains. It's a trivial thing to do so as long as they're EVM compatible, but we don't think it makes sense. It's just those are maintenance costs if you don't have traction behind it. Perfect. Sounds good. Uh, we'll stop here. So Otherwise, they're going to kick us out. Unlike one of those people that likes to smile as well. Cool, got it. Thank you. We'll Thank actually you continue much. our chat uh, out out there as well. Yeah. well I mean, it's, it's quite interesting what you're doing, um, especially uh, for I mean, just now I had a couple of conversations and this 2024-25, we are entering the institutional era for the blockchain and anything to do with institutions has a lot of interest validation and users, which crypt most of the blockchain projects don't have. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's quite... If, um, if uh, you want to have a Visa or a MasterCard or Amex with a private underlying transaction in there, you need something to happen. Hmm. Because... <laughs> well, but most of them are trying to create their own blockchain right now. Like MasterCard, JP, Morgan. They just want their own blockchain. Yeah, I don't know what they're going to do with it. But So they can have their own blockchain. I've, I've done work with MasterCard on the subject. Uh, and I've had discussions with Visa as well on stablecoin infrastructure. One, they're like really far behind. Mm -hmm. Two, 